What would this channel be if we didn't keep up our pace of fun inaugurals? New airlines, new airports, new aircraft, and new routes. We're here to try all kinds of aviation firsts, and today adds to this saga as we fly JetBlue's newest long-haul transatlantic route from their main hub in New York's JFK airport out to Edinburgh, Scotland. In October last year, JetBlue announced service to Dublin and Edinburgh, adding to their existing services to London, both Gatwick and Heathrow, Paris, and Amsterdam, although the Dutch will be shutting that one down soon. Just before St. Patrick's Day, that Dublin route launched as their fifth airport across the pond, and today we get to be on the inaugural to the sixth airport. My first inaugural with JetBlue, so let's see what kind of a party these people can whip up. Welcome to Terminal 5 at JFK. With Terminal 6 being demolished 10 to 15 years ago, this has been JetBlue's terminal. They've shared the space with airlines like Aer Lingus and Cape Air over the years, but it remains essentially solely theirs, at least until the new Terminal 6 is completed. Right now, it looks like this, however. But eventually, according to New York's local CBS News, it should look like this in about two years planned to house JetBlue and the Lufthansa Group, a homage to their partnership since the mid-2000s. Back to their current home, however, the walk into the terminal makes it very clear who runs this terminal. Makes me wonder if it's going to feel like a shell of itself once JetBlue splits town. The check-in area has a couple separate areas for Mint and Mosaic customers, Mint being their business class and Mosaic being their highest status members in the True Blue program. For the rest of us common folk, the check-in's like 80% self-service kiosk so that you only need to see a counter if you have a specific question. You also can check in curbside, although you'll have to pay an additional $3 per checked bag. Bags checked and through security, which took about 10 minutes, were into Terminal 5 which houses all JetBlue and Cape Air flights. JetBlue being like 99% of the flights though. As soon as we entered, the balloons signaled that they were ready for a party, but we had to wait a little as the party wasn't set to begin until about an hour and a half before boarding. In the meantime, we got to explore JFK's Terminal 5. Now, Terminal 5 definitely ain't bad, but for JetBlue, the days here are numbered. JFK is notorious for airlines shifting terminals what seems like every day. One of the biggest complaints amongst JetBlue passengers is the lack of an airport lounge. There have been rumors floating around forever, but still no such thing exists. Not even for transatlantic business class passengers. No JetBlue lounge, no contract lounge, and if you want to use your priority pass, you can't even do that, as JFK doesn't connect their terminals inside security, so you're here in Terminal 5 and only here, where there is no lounge. There's a chance we see a change to that soon, however. In an incredible article from One Mile at a Time, Mosaic Clubs may be coming to JetBlue's largest hubs of New York and Boston. In 2022, JetBlue posted a job opening titled Senior Analyst Lounge Product and Strategy Development, with a description sounding like they were bringing someone in to plan a lounge. Discussions around lounge spaces like this are typically public, so since we haven't heard anything, I'm going to expect we're quite a ways away from anything serious. There's also the fact that JetBlue will be moving to the new Terminal 6 once that's complete in a year and a half, so they may wait until they get their brand new space. Access will most likely be guaranteed to Transatlantic Mint customers, and the Mosaic name hints that their Mosaic status members would also get access. Then the main question left is if transcontinental business class passengers will get access, something practiced by some other carriers. Most likely it'll be smaller than lounges like Polaris and American's flagship with less available seats. So I would doubt and hope that they don't allow priority pass or paid access to avoid the lounge overcrowding epidemic. One thing is for sure though, and that's that JetBlue's design and customer service teams are unparalleled, so I have no doubt the lounge spaces will be incredible. In the meantime, all passengers do have access to the space known as the Terminal 5 rooftop, a great place to relax in the sun and take in the views of one of the world's largest airports. One issue, the once peaceful view is essentially all construction at this point. We get a great view of the scaffolding of the still-in-progress Terminal 6 and the roadways in front of Terminal 5. Like, seriously, you get better ramp views just in the terminal looking out the windows. At least there's a way to get fresh air even if there's no charging outlets. At the end of one of the three main hallways is Gate 14, our gate for the day. They were still setting up the celebrations, but the aircraft was here. 
a three-year-old A321neo that has lived its whole life with JetBlue. By the time they finished decorating, the entire end of the hallway was set up for us, complete with an arch and balloons which could be in either JetBlue colors, Scotland's flag colors, or maybe it's just a coincidence that they match. The Scottish flags were strung across the ceiling and scattered around the bar, where they were highlighting their bottles of scotch. The window with ramp views was decorated with the flags, but after not long, they set up the backdrop for the speakers behind the podium. In addition, there was a whole spread of Scottish snacks. There were cupcakes, which were normal but had the Edinburgh sticker on them, then the meat and some soda breads, and some commemorative pins that could not be eaten. The drinks were water, lemonade, and a Scottish soda type drink. But no spread would be complete, however, without some of those shortbread cookies which we found around the corner. There was also a fun art piece with Edinburgh scenery and a jet blue aircraft flying overhead. Everyone gathered around getting their food and talking about Scotland when, all of a sudden, the distant sound of bagpipes could be heard as, from down the hallway, one of Port Authority's officers came marching down the hallway with his bagpipe through the crowd to launch our celebrations. After that iconic entrance, we got our speeches. Kinda. There was a technical issue, so we had to use backup speakers. Eventually the backup also died, so we reverted to the PA system. Eventually that broke, and the speakers had to just kinda yell to the crowd. Live, learn, adapt, overcome, something like that. Regardless, we did get some great speeches from JFK's Director of Airport Operations, the COO of JetBlue, Chris Thompson from the Scottish offices in DC, and the Senior Vice President of Visit Britain, the largest tourism sponsor for the United Kingdom. Then it was time for the ribbon cutting, including the aforementioned people along with the flight crew for our flight today. A fairly short ceremony meant that we could board on time. JetBlue boards in groups with Mint and Mosaic customers and then A through F depending on your ticketing class. As we board our flight across the pond, I'll mention a major gripe I have with narrow body versus wide body operations is that the single aisle can create a traffic jam of sorts. Fortunately, I was able to get on towards the front of the boarding group, so with a still fairly empty cabin, I welcome you all on board JetBlue's A321LR, the only aircraft type of theirs that makes these transatlantic journeys, starting with the absolutely stunning mint suites up front. I wish I could be here, but you can't win them all, so as we continue back, we reach the core cabin as they call it, starting with seven rows of their even more space seats, and then the rest of the core cabin, where we'll be sitting today. I count 17 JetBlue flights in my lifetime, and I've been in economy for all but one of these times, so I'm fairly familiar with this cabin. In seat 30A, it's a short hike to the back of the narrowbody aircraft to find our seat. Now JetBlue's economy class has been long regarded as one of the best, so let's see just how incredible that is. First off, you can see the setup of the 3-3 cabin with the standard long haul amenities waiting for us with a goodie bag that we'll check out shortly. The headrest feels almost memory foam, it's so comfy and the adjustability never gives me any problems trying to sleep. The seat itself is the same material, so it's nice and cozy, in addition to the material breathing better than average so you're not super hot. The rows each have one to two windows depending on which one you're in, each with a great view of this New York sunset behind the Terminal 5 concourse. In front of us is one of the larger and more modern in-flight entertainment systems above your average economy tray table. Above that, thanks to this plane being a narrow body, we do have individual air vents. Below that is one of my favorite seat pockets just because of its many sections. The large section has the literature separated so you can use the whole pocket. Then on the front is smaller pockets for a phone or water bottle, and then an elastic grid to hold chargers or something. Kind of like what we see in Air France's business class. 
There is universal charging ports with USB plugs between the seats. This means that there's only two plugs for every three seats. Not to worry because there's a USB plug on the TV too. If you need the wall plug, you better get to talking with your seat neighbor. The legroom is perhaps the best part of this seat. JetBlue's tied for second place in the world with 32 inches of pitch behind only Japan Airlines and tied with Singapore, EVA, ANA, and Emirates. Not bad company to be in for sure. I mean seriously, I'm 5 foot 9 inches and there's ample space here. The only reference I have is with the safety card but you can see the space with that. Even with my backpack down there, I'm not too cramped and I can still spread out a bit. We did get some extra special amenities for the inaugural, but on these long haul flights the standard amenities do include this blanket. It's not the thickest thing in the world, but honestly I flew Egypt Air business class a couple weeks ago and I swear it's the same blanket. Definitely better than 99% of economy blankets out there. We also get a sleep kit, something we don't get in most economy seats. And if we're being honest, the eye mask and earplugs are the most important thing in the amenity kits on overnight flights. We did also get free earbuds. They aren't the best quality or most comfortable, but they don't mumble the sound like most cheap economy earbuds. Then the goodie bag for all passengers on board. It includes all kinds of Scottish freebies such as broccoli chips, biscuits, a chocolate covered marshmallow, an orange oat bar, chocolate caramel bar, a couple cookies, a postcard with the same Edinburgh art and JetBlue aircraft, a little Scottish flag, and then a little pouch of zero alcohol scotch. Arriving in 2021, the A321 LR welcomed a new and exciting chapter for JetBlue. For starters, it allowed them to reach across oceans to Europe and Hawaii with the 4,000 nautical mile range, which they'd been evaluating but it also was the perfect time to reimagine their cabins along with the contribution towards their push towards carbon net zero. Up front, these aircraft would feature a new brand of JetBlue's signature Mint business class service, including the game-changing Mint Studio Suites, which have the most space and biggest bed of any premium cabin on US carriers. If you're curious, check out my video in the Mint Studio from Paris to New York from last year. The 1-1 setup of Mint did reduce the business class capacity from 24 down to 16, and although the aisle-facing herringbone setup has faced criticism for the difficulty of window views, the seats have proved comfy and a better setup for sleep, with heads being further from the aisle. That's not all though. JetBlue reimagined their main cabin as well, stating that they would need to tackle three major issues the dreaded center section, the choice of assembly line chicken or beef, and the lack of connectivity. For the first of these issues, they became the first to install the airspace interior, which claimed to bring wide body comfort to a narrow body aircraft. For the second issue, partnering with DIG, they have brought a whole new way to order your food with assortments of selections, even in economy, and that's on top of the pantry as they call it, allowing all passengers to get snacks and cold drinks at their leisure throughout the flight. For the final issue of connectivity, JetBlue continues to offer free in-flight Wi-Fi for all passengers, and one of the best in-flight entertainment systems out there. I'd say they've put together a heck of a product and personally, it's my choice on these flights across the Atlantic from the East Coast every time.
Looking through the in-flight entertainment, there's a few steps towards initializing. But first, hello JetBlue. It explains how to use the blueprint system as they call it, where you can have your own profile essentially and keep track of the things that you watch on JetBlue flights. Before going any further, we had to order our meals. To save time on service, you choose your main course and meals directly on the screen in front of you. Then they can assemble the trays and just distribute them as they come down the aisle rather than having to take everyone's order. An excellent system used in all their cabin classes that I haven't seen on any other carrier, but I love it. Once initialized, it remembers who I am and where we're going. JetBlue does have one of the best in-flight entertainment systems out there with a ton of different categories of content. If looking at all content, however, you'll be surprised at the sheer amount of genres you can sort by. This applies to the movies and TV shows, which is the proof you need to see how many choices are available. Not all TV shows have full seasons, but once again, you can sort by shows that do have full seasons. And to pay homage to the Scottish launch, there's a whole category of things filmed in Scotland. Best of all though, since there's so much stuff here, we can easily add things to favorites, and then finding the items later only requires you to click the heart to pull up all of these programs. JetBlue is also one of the few carriers to still offer live TV on board their aircraft, which is great for watching major events going on in the world. They do have a couple bonus features, however. First off, when you go to watch something, there's an option called Watch Party, where you can watch the program with others on board. Perfect if you're traveling with someone else. In addition, you can also set up your phone to be used as an external remote to connect to the Seatback TV. One of the best perks of JetBlue's entertainment is their Wi-Fi system. JetBlue's also one of the many carriers offering Wi-Fi on board their aircraft, but it doesn't end there. Wi-Fi appeared first on aircraft in 2003 when Boeing introduced the option and installed it on British and Lufthansa 747s. In 2010, Virgin America was the first US carrier to bring in Wi-Fi, but when JetBlue introduced full fleet Wi-Fi in 2013, they made it free for all passengers. More than 10 years later and the same policy still applies, and like, it ain't bad. You can browse social media or stream shows with their business partners Peacock. Not even an advertisement from me, literally just a perk if you happen to be a Peacock customer already. If not, Mosaic status members can get up to 12 months free of Peacock, and other True Blue members can get 1,000 points by subscribing to Peacock. So like, big plus having fast and free Wi-Fi, especially at the streaming level. First was a beverage service. It's worth noting that all drinks are complimentary, so go ahead and order that glass of wine or that can of beer. Then it was time for the meal. As mentioned, everyone had ordered on the screen before departure. On top of that, they used three flight attendants with three carts for the economy cabin. All in all, they got everyone served faster than I've possibly ever seen before. I chose to go with the ginger garlic tofu main. Not because I love tofu, but the flavor sounded better than the chicken and let me tell you, that was the move. The soba noodles were great and the apple cider vinegar sauce was even better. The fennel salad wasn't bad, but the snap peas came in a mint pesto and feta cheese. I'm not gonna lie y'all, this may be the all time best economy meals in my travels and even rivals some business class meals. Why can't the other US carriers get on the grind like this? The only drawback, that zero alcohol scotch, best way I can describe it, kinda tastes like moldy juice. Then it was time for sleep. Well, not for me, but for most people. First off, the recline. You can see here the amount of recline from a shot before departure. It's not exactly life changing, but not horrendous. Honestly, with the amount of leg room, if you just slump down a bit, you get a good sleep angle, especially against the window. Then the blanket, which coupled with the overhead air vent, allows us to set our perfect temperature for sleep. Having a pillow doesn't even matter because you've got that great headrest. And as if we needed any more help to sleep, we can use the eye mask and earplugs. Only the second airline that has ever offered me that in economy, with the other being Saudi. Looking around, I was shocked at the amount of people who ended up sleeping the entire flight between services. This, however, brings up the biggest issue with this cabin. With a 4,000 nautical mile range, they can only take this aircraft so far. Currently, Paris is the longest flight, which averages 7 hours on the red eye. You figure that it takes about 90 minutes until the dinner service is finished, then there's about an hour at the end of the flight where they do the pre-arrival service and make a million announcements as they prep for landing. 
This leaves you only four and a half hours for sleep. Even if you're a professional sleeper, it's tough to utilize all this time and you still wouldn't be getting a full night's sleep. The East Coast Red Eyes have this problem, so typically I just stay awake. Coming from the West Coast where I live, the Europe flights are all about 10 to 12 hours. Plenty of time to eat both meals, toss and turn, and still get enough sleep for your body to function right the next day. That's all fine and dandy, but that will just never be possible with JetBlue since their planes just can't reach that distance. I guess what I'm saying is the biggest problem is that there isn't enough time on board, which is a good problem to have, I guess. Ready for one of my favorite features of this cabin? Welcome the pantry, or the name for the in-flight snack bar. If at any point you're feeling a bit peckish, you can wander up here from any cabin class and grab some snacks and drinks. Typically, this type of thing is only available in business class, so as an economy passenger, to be able to go grab some sweet or savory snacks whenever I'd like is an incredible luxury. Located right between economy and business classes, it was a great stop for me to stretch my legs, grab some pretzels and a refreshment on both my transcontinental and my transatlantic flight. Now, I'ma be honest, this is about as dark as it got the whole flight. As the days are getting longer, places up north here see sun almost all day. This is during dinner and it was still light on the horizon. You figure we took off just before sunset, then the sun set almost all the way, and then halfway through the flight, it began to rise again. A quick progression through the night, so if the sun naturally wakes you up usually, you might have some trouble on flights like this with no eye mask. I will say however, just due to the curvature of the earth and our position versus the suns, it got about this light and then stayed that way for about an hour before the sun rose anymore. Eventually the sun came up and so did the lights in the cabin signaling the beginning of breakfast. I do have to say that they completely nailed dinner but kind of fell off come breakfast time. That's somewhat normal with airlines but the stark contrast is somewhat shocking. There is one redeeming feature however. Dunkin Donuts coffee. I will put up with all kinds of stuff or even just not eat it and let the Dunkin coffee alone be my breakfast, which I may or may not have done on a semi-regular basis. JetBlue's attempt at growth can be described with the common phrase, two steps forward, one step back. Nothing characterizes this more than their attempt at a merger. JetBlue faces the same issues of most US carriers. United, Delta, American, and Southwest are established, but other than that, it's a fight for market share and most carriers have to look into a merger to help grow. The first major push came in the mid-2010s when airlines were bidding to acquire Virgin America. Alaska and JetBlue were in a bidding war but for their own reasons. Alaska wanted to stifle competition in their main markets, JetBlue wanted to grow out west, a market that it had always struggled to thrive in despite their Long Beach hub. JetBlue and Virgin were the most alike of US carriers with an elevated customer experience that brought the most intense loyal fans, myself being one of them. Alaska had a much more conservative business model despite not having the same customer experience. In the end, JetBlue decided they had cornered the East Coast market enough that the price point wasn't worth it for just an additional West Coast hub or two. JetBlue did launch a huge push towards targeting Virgin America loyalists, expanding their transcontinental services, business class offerings, and saw a rise in JetBlue members, once again, myself included. If JetBlue had pulled it off, we would have likely seen them with a large San Francisco base with Virgin slots, adding to their existing Long Beach base, but probably would have delayed or even canceled their transatlantic plans, and Alaska would still be predominantly cornered in the Pacific Northwest. With that venture out the window, their next goal was spirit, something that really evolved since COVID. JetBlue knows that in order to remain a staple in US aviation, they'll need to grow their West Coast presence. When Virgin's acquisition filled, the next plan was Spirit Airlines, the infamous ultra low cost carrier. This plan would completely extinguish the Spirit brand as it was the complete opposite of JetBlue's brand and business model. Instead, they just wanted the aircraft and, most importantly, the landing slots and hubs. The merger would have added seven hubs and grown JetBlue's current hubs in Orlando and Fort Lauderdale. Most importantly, however, is Las Vegas, one of Spirit's largest operating bases and a perfect launch point for West Coast flights in addition to the Southern California base, which had recently moved from Long Beach to Los Angeles. The merger fought a number of legal battles claiming the merger would cause damage to the low-cost market, 
with the largest ultra low cost carrier being dissolved and due to the number of issues, they ran out of time and the merger was officially set aside earlier this year. It turns out the original thought was to acquire Alaska Airlines, a merger that would have likely created another major carrier in the US, even with an all narrow body fleet. But apparently the Alaska plan never really materialized and talks never really began. For the first time ever, JetBlue has landed in Scotland. As always, I enjoyed my flight on JetBlue and it remains my favorite economy. Everything from the comfortable seats to the incredible food to the entertainment options and the crew themselves, I always get off thinking that it was a pleasant experience. Now I know this might be a hot take, I know, but in business class, a wide body may be better because you get the roomier cabin. In economy though, the narrow body feels less crowded with less people and I feel that it's even more comfortable than an economy in a wide body. Even in business class, if it's a good enough seat like JetBlue Mint, who cares how big the cabin is? Honestly, I'm a big fan of JetBlue's transatlantic services with one drawback. The flights just aren't far enough. I wish I could get this level of service and quality from the west coast to Europe, but that's just not something that exists. JetBlue offers the most generous economy legroom in the US and second best in the world, with their even more space seats with an additional 6 inches leaving more than enough space. Their whole build your own table concept to customize the meal is one of the greatest features I've seen in air travel, and if that's not enough food for you, you can just waltz on over to the pantry and grab some extra snacks on these transatlantic and select transcontinental domestic flights. The price is the last major thing we have to discuss. JetBlue prided themselves on the transatlantic routing, partially motivated by disrupting the major legacy carrier's operation, driving down costs. So how do they compare? Looking at one-way flights from New York to Europe, the major carriers list economy for three to $500, and business class for all under $2,000 at the cheapest. Compared to JetBlue, who sells their cheapest economy fares for as low as $200, but business class for all over $2,000. Essentially, they offer the best cheap and easy getaway fares, but Mint is priced as a much more competitive product. At this point, there's no official plans for JetBlue's next European destinations, but if we track demand out of Boston and New York hubs, I'd expect to see something like Lisbon, Rome, or Milan. One thing I would love to see would be Hawaii. And I know JetBlue had been looking into that for a while, but with the shrinking West Coast operations, I doubt we see that anytime soon. People love to complain about narrow body aircraft on these long haul flights, and for a while, I totally agreed. I've since decided the cabin makes all the difference. The JetBlue economy cabin is better than many wide body economy cabins in terms of comfort and amenities, which is really all that matters. So I guess I'm officially on board with this model, when done correctly that is. But let me know what you think, and until next Sunday, safe travels, I'll see y'all next time.